You have 30 minutes. Okay, and eight to 10 minutes for Q and A. Let's get started. Thank you. Thank you all for coming this morning. I hope you all have your coffee. Okay. Uh, there are four axioms that I'd like to talk about. Logical and represent representational systems, uh, meaning as being wholly individual, and knowledge learning as being constructed on acts of meaning making, and learners as physiological, biological beings. Everybody can read, and I'm going to go through these individually, but first I would like to uh, talk about online technology. In my class, I teach critical theory, and I also teach Spanish. My critical theory class has uh, mixed learners. I have native Spanish speakers, sometimes I have Chinese students. All of my students take a language beforehand. We offer German, Spanish, French, Chinese. Uh, so we teach the class in English, and I think this is very relevant for people teaching English as a second language. Uh, some of the things that I found in my class was I was constantly struggling to get my students to put away their PDAs, their phones, their handheld devices, and instead of fighting it, uh, I decided to embrace it. So I use podcasts, and I am a national public radio junkie. Uh, we have this in our country, and I wake up to it, I go to bed to it. They're wonderful podcasts. Uh, I hear them during the day. I don't personally know how to do half of what I assign my students to do, but they're very capable of downloading the podcast. I tell them where to go, and I give them a link. They click on that, and then they download it onto their, uh, their PDAs, and they really love this because they don't have to sit still. They can be exercising, they can be going to the gym, they can be going on a walk, doing the dishes. Uh, they're capable of listening to current events. And with critical theory and language learning, uh, it's important for me to introduce concepts that are being talked about currently. So these are very fresh, they're sometimes a day old. I try not to use anything that's more than a week old. It makes the class very spontaneous and fun. Uh, I also use videos from TED Talks, and if you've never seen a TED Talks video, these are tremendous. They have information all across the board uh, from very innovative speakers, very creative speakers, that go farther and ask more questions about the topics that are current. Uh, we also look at Harvard Lecture Series. I'm not an expert in any one area. And these people are. So for me, I am able to offer my students what I might not, as one individual teacher, be a master of. Uh, they get to hear very detailed, rich information. We also watch YouTube videos. Some of the YouTube videos we see uh, are five minutes long. They're put together by students. Some are put together by professionals. They get to hear a variety of dialects, languages, and topics. And they find it engaging because eventually what they're going to do is their own videos. And we also use blogs. Uh, we talk about all of the current issues that they hear through the podcasts and uh, through watching the videos in class. Uh, we have discussions in class. What I see though are some students take longer to formulate ideas. Some students feel shy about expressing their ideas. So the blog is not a high-tech tool. It's very accessible, and it provides students an opportunity to express themselves. And we'll get a little farther into that later. All right, and then we also watch pop culture movies such as The Matrix. We look at The Matrix to talk about Marxist theory. Uh, we look at Inception to talk about dream analysis, which is another tool I use. And we watch Avatar, which actually goes into having an outside experience, uh, extending your identity, which is a tool that I use in the classroom. Okay. And websites. This is extremely important for me. What I do is show students how to view websites uh, if you typed in information about global warming, you would get 3,000 hits. 
And that's a lot of information for a student to process. So what I have them do is look at keywords that's in the website, that's embedded in the website, and also pay attention to the advertisements that are along the websites. Everybody tells a story. And the information we have at, at our fingertips on the internet is not neutral. Somebody has created it and put it there for a reason. So what I try and teach my students to do is think critically about the story that's embedded in the website. Uh, if I typed in global warming hoax, I'm going to get information that goes that way. If I type in global warming crisis, there'll be different information. And it's up to the students to start thinking critically, how do I view this information and how do I use the information to tell my story? Because they will do research and they need to be aware of what they're doing. Okay, and then eventually what we do is personal videos that are uploaded to the department website as a resource. They do presentations, some of them do PowerPoint presentations. Um, but what we do is we videotape them presenting, and they have partners in the classroom that help them before they present and during the presentation. What I find is that they have a different investment when they do their own video, and we've seen this throughout the conference. People have talked about how students go forth and interview. They're having an experience that is engaging and they're contributing to the information so it's more meaningful and they're making meaning with the information they use. Okay, Axiom 1, logical and representational systems are constructed through interaction with the world including people and contain each person's individual operational history. Uh, this can be a little intense here. Um, what, what I'm trying to do is make my students aware of how they think and how they perceive the world. And what I do, because it's simple, is dream analysis. We look at Freud's ideas, and we look at Lacan's ideas, and I have just a very simple checklist that my students use. They read the checklist before they go to bed at night. It has latent content, manifest content. Uh, it's basic terms from Freud that deal with dream analysis. When they wake up in the morning, their job is to just put in a few words describing what their dream was and what it might mean. They bring that information to class and then they discuss what they think their dream's about and they partner up with somebody who helps them analyze and then we analyze as a group what it could mean. Uh, what this does for my students is it helps them recognize multiple layers of self. We walk around on a daily basis in the conscious world, but much of our actions are influenced by our subconscious and unconscious. So this helps students become aware of different levels of self. This is very important as a tool for language learning as well. Uh, so we realize that what we see is not always what we get. That people might give us directions that aren't correct because they want to save face. They don't want to say, I don't know where I am because it's not culturally acceptable. So this is a very easy surface way to approach different aspects of how we act. Uh, learners also identify their drives or motivations for doing what they do. And this is, to me, kind of an extension. Uh, we have unconscious fears that cause us to act the way we do. We might. Uh, if we have issues with fears of intimacy, we will break up with people. Um, if we have self-esteem issues, we might project that we are smarter than the person next to us. Uh, these help students understand themselves, and they also get a sense of people in the group, in the classroom, how they interact, and this helps them prepare for dealing with what I call, you know, the more or less real world. Uh, when we work in groups, in an office or in a business or in a school. We have multiple personalities that we have to deal with and negotiate. If we have a sense of our own personalities, we can to some extent intuit how other people will act and give them what they need in order for us to get what we need. Okay. Uh, this also gives learners an opportunity to develop a level of trust with the teacher and the classmates. In order to really 
further explore ourselves, we have to have this level of trust. And when we talk about dreams, it's easy, but very, very intimate. People find they're caught off guard sometimes. So the level of intimacy lets students become aware that they can share and they're, they're risk taking, which is part of what we do with language learning. We're taking a risk. We're taking a risk of feeling foolish or silly or having other people know things about us that we might not want to share. Okay. Uh, learners collaborate with this as well. Uh, again, it's an easy tool where we all work together. If we're all analyzing me, my personality, my dreams, and how I might better uh, work on my strengths or, or explore my weaknesses in a safe environment, uh, it's a type of collaboration. Uh, through the class, after we go through dream analysis, again, we do collaboration with videos, we do collaboration with just basic communication of what we want. Because this class is designed to work with materials that are very, very new, yeah, again, I try not to do anything more than a week old, it's easy for me to find out what my students' interests are and gear podcasts and TED Talks and Harvard videos towards their interests. So then they become more engaged and they work together. Okay, axiom two. Meaning is wholly individual and is constructed on the basis of one's past as expressed through each person's logical and representational systems. Everything is perception. I had the great fortune of working with Andrew Lyon for the past year. I, we miss him terribly. Uh, we would have these wonderful discussions about the lens through which we perceive our reality. And the thing that I find interesting is engaging my students in being aware that they can change their realities. A lot of times we feel we're very fixed in our identities and unchanging. When we start looking at languages, we are using new filters and exploring how the world is constructed around us. And we find that things that look very familiar are all of a sudden different because they're put in a different context. Uh, I do this primarily through exploring ideologies. Uh, um, it's said that the most powerful ideologies are considered inherent or natural as opposed to being the constructions they are. Uh, as an American, an ideology that I point out to my students is this idea of rugged individualism, that each of us pulls ourselves up by our own bootstraps, as we say, that we don't ask for help from others because it's considered weak. This is an ideology. This isn't really how we have to function. And most of us need that idea of collaboration in order to succeed. Um, many of the times, I have my students write down a list on the first day how they identify themselves. Even gender, which looks like something it's biological, it's not going to change. Our perceptions of gender change from culture to culture and our perceptions of self change to say I'm a, a female American is one thing. Who am I when I go to a different culture? I find that it's more flexible than I had imagined. Uh, religion is something that we find controls us and engages us in ways that sometimes we're unaware of. So I have my students work through these, and then we take a look at their flexibility. Identity for me and for the rest of us is very malleable. It's in a constant state of revision. Our experiences will influence our future experiences. And if we are aware of this, we're able to revise or change our identities through our experiences. Now, this sounds kind of confusing, but the experience you're having right now will, at some level, change how you teach your students. You're going to have a different way of perceiving things after this conference with all the information you have gathered here. And it can get a lot more in depth, which is exciting. It is based on the student's interest and capability. Uh, axiom three. Knowledge and learning is constructed on acts of meaning making. If you do not make some kind of sense of something, then you cannot learn it or know it. I, I use the blogs again as a, a place for us to explore the ideas we've had in class and have a, a safe place for people to have time to think, to choose their words. Uh, 
learners have a chance to find and express their unique voices and contribute. Again, in the classroom, which is my favorite place to be, it's very engaging and dynamic. I am a dynamic person and I might talk over some of my students. And I have students that always want to be the first to answer something. And then I miss these students. I find on the blog the ones that are quiet in class have so much to say and have this unique contribution that might not have been uh, explored in the classroom because of their personalities. Uh, learners can dialogue using an egalitarian form of communication. I try to keep the classroom where everybody has an opportunity to talk, but here on a blog it provides a, a round table, uh, quote unquote, where everybody is required to talk and share their idea and they can look and have a dialogue with the voices that are on the blog that have spoken before. And I, I really find this is a great extension of what we do in the classroom. I know for me, sometimes my best ideas come a couple hours after a conversation. So this, again, provides people with that opportunity. Uh, the video presentations, again, provide uh, learners an opportunity to explore their interests and their passions. I have them choose where they lie in their experience, who they are, what really uh, you know, motivates them or, or they gravitate towards. That's where they choose a topic. Then it ties into uh, the tenets of the class. So there's always critical theory involved, but they come about it from feminist theory or from Marxism or from the ideas of Derrida or Baudrillard. Uh, they're invested more deeply when they share with others. When you just write a paper and you hand it in to your teacher, it's kind of a letdown. You've put a lot of time and commitment and energy into a thought or an idea, and then nobody else gets to see it. And a lot of times you get it and you've got nothing. You throw it in the trash after you get your grade. Because what do you do? Uh, with this, they have this opportunity to share. They utilize the research tools that I discussed earlier about really engaging websites and looking at the sources of information. They also interview people that they know. There might be experts in the field. I encourage people to contact live experts in the field. Uh, there's so many people that are available online to communicate. They collaborate with their classmates and they collaborate with other teachers or people outside of the department. So where we are in a language learning environment, they might go to the psychology department or they might go to the biology department and make new connections. So. The collaboration is very important. We don't know where we're going to be five years from now uh, with any of our jobs, our employment. What we have to do is learn how to think outside the box and make those connections with others. Uh, and then finally, they create something meaningful to be shared with others. We uh, are working on putting this on our website at the university in the foreign language department. It will be accessible to those that are on our Facebook site, which is mostly foreign language students. This is a, a closed environment, so it's safe for them to explore their ideas now and not worry about five years from now having somebody look and say, what were you thinking? Um, so it's a good place for that. Okay, axiom four. Learners are physiological, biological beings with all the constraints that this implies. Uh, when we're learning a language, we're limited after a certain point of time. Wada uh, and I were talking, I teach Spanish. I will never have the same Spanish R that she has. She's a native speaker and learned it at an early age. So I have to make accommodations. And, uh, <clears throat> and there are constraints with this. I also am going to have my perceptions and my realities due to my physical being. Uh, we learn through our bodies, though, and this is something that I enjoy doing, especially in my lower level Spanish classes. I work with total, total physical response. I have early morning classes, and I won't do it to you all, but I, I say, levántate, vamos, you know, get up, let's get moving. And they look at me like, no, no, yeah. So, it, but they remember, they get up, and then I say, baila, baila, and they say, no, and then when I say, canta, sing, they say, absolutely not, but they remember, and sometimes we'll pick on one or two students, and they always get the same thing, two bailas, por favor, you know, so they, they learn these words by actually getting up and physically moving around and doing it, 
And our bodies remember these things. Uh, now, how that works with critical theory is a little bit more extensive. It's, again, this engagement of the self and the collaboration with others. But as language learners, if we can engage our bodies, it's going to make it more powerful. Okay, thank you. Okay, can we escape our physical selves? This is something that I've been finding all sorts of information on that I find extremely engaging. We can't leave our bodies. Um, the movie Avatar, the, the, the star of the film is in a wheelchair, he has no use of his legs, and he escapes into this other reality, this other physical <coughs> being, and he's able to explore other parts of his identity. Uh, Online role-playing games such as Second Life are very popular right now. This can be a really great tool for exploring our realities. It can be a great tool for language learning. And I know Anya and Andrew worked on the construction of an online French village. People become invested in these personalities, these online personalities, and they commit to uh, engaging with others online in a safe environment. Again, uh, language and social networks, Wada Cabello Timmons has been exploring online resources that, that provide us cultural opportunities that maybe we can't all go to Spain because of the cost. Uh, but here we have this opportunity to go to cultural cafes and learn new things and experience uh, other people who are online and engaging in these same activities. Even Twitter is a place where you don't have to say, I am a female from the United States, I could be a man from Taiwan. Nobody knows. And many of the funny, really intense Twitter feeds, you know, they say they're one person and they're actually somebody else. <clears throat> in these environments, the participants, the participant in a sense, is free of the constraints of race, class, ethnicity, gender, and to some extent, even your personality. Uh, and I keep going back to uh, maybe more introverted people uh, who want to express themselves but feel it's too much of a risk. This is a space where you can really explore alternate forms of your personality. And through that, uh, maybe extend your identity. And it's an exciting place to engage people. Okay. Okay, an online environment can provide access to information, as I was saying, opportunities to participants who might not otherwise be able to experience these things. Uh, online environments allow participants to take risks without real world consequences. Uh, and online environments provide a safe place to play with one's sense of identity. It used to be in college, uh, students were able to maybe go join the normal group which advocates the legalization of marijuana. Most students are not going to do that now because they're worried about running for political office five years from now and they don't want people to know these things about themselves. So there's less risk taking now than there used to be in college. Uh, so these online spaces provide, again, this, this extension, this time out, quote unquote, where people can explore who they are and who they might want to be in, a, in an environment where the risks are low. Okay, in conclusion, one can effectively use critical thinking and technology to provide a framework for sophisticated language learning. Again, these tools are not complex. I always have my students do most of the work because the technology has a chance of failing with me. These people are, you know, digital natives as we were talking about. Most of the students already know how to work this technology. They want to use the technology and engage in it. I just and giving them tools to do critical thinking on how it's used and how it's used to explore themselves and in a sense develop how they recognize themselves with interactions with others. Okay, thank you. I've got time for questions. Yeah, it's time for our Q&A. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, listen to your presentation and have a question. What, length, uh, what courses are you teaching? Philosophy? Uh, psychology? <laughs> a little bit of everything. <laughs> uh, some, of the, some of the fun things we've done, there's some online websites. I always tell my students I view about 50 websites before I give them one. Um, I'm an extreme critical thinker on what, <clears throat> what I'm going to share with the class because I'm very, very aware of the angles that are projected. 
Uh, we did an online personality test that just groups you into some of Jung's concepts of identity. And, uh, and we started off with that as a way of talking, as a way of introducing ourselves. And it was fun because it was, for many students, an introduction to themselves. We laughed, I did it, I, uh, and it had all my weaknesses completely, completely to a T. And it had my strengths as well. But seeing that on paper gives you another tool. Um, yes, there's a lot of philosophy in the class, there's a lot of critical thinking and critical theory. And the critical theory aspect can be a real turnoff for students. They think it's dead French intellectuals that we're going to talk about. This is a way of engaging them. I try and engage them through pop culture, through media, through things that they're already involved in. And okay, you're teaching Spanish, right? Teaching Spanish and, and too. Activities that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I I wonder the language you are using in running those activities because even for me myself, I, I am a Thai. I use Thai, and if, uh, to use Thai in doing all those activities, maybe. I still have some difficulties. And uh, they are people studying Spanish, second language, right? And doing all those uh, complicated activities. I, I wonder, uh, do you have any difficulties running that? What, what I do in my Spanish classes is more podcasts where they're cultural experiences. And Wada is going to be talking uh, at 1 o'clock about some online cafes that she uses. They're opportunities for us to explore culture where we hear people talking in the native language. And the real benefit for my students, they're at a very low level. Uh, when we do podcasts and we do videos, they're able to hear them over and over again, and they're able to hear other dialects. I studied in Spain, I have a Castilian accent with an American tint, a Midwestern American tint. Uh, Guada's gonna have a different accent. We might study Argentinian culture and we hear it in that language. So the students are exposed to multiple accents through the podcasts and the videos, and that's the benefit they get there. And again, that repetition where they didn't get it the first time, they can hear it again. I, I think one of the things you didn't say, because I have inside knowledge, <laughs> uh, is that there are several phase of pieces yeah. to the language learning environment. You're not talking about a single class right. where you do all of these things. You're talking about there are Spanish classes, mm -hmm. and there's a critical theory class, yes. and there's a something else class, there's a culture class or a literature class, and together they form the language learning environment. Yes. The, the so, so they're not doing Spanish one, where you, know, you need to learn to conjugate verbs or something, and discussing this in Spanish. Right. Right? So these are different pieces which together form the environment. Yes, and this and that might be. I'm primarily talking about is a capstone course. It's for language learners that have, they're usually at a three or four hundred level in their target language. So this is an opportunity to take the information they've gathered. Sometimes I think maybe this would be a great class as the beginning class before they learn a language because they're knowing themselves. <laughs> Um, but yes, Andrew's exactly right. What we do is multiple things in multiple areas. This primarily is done in English. I was just wondering about your axioms. Do you, they inform your teaching at the start of the course, or do you want the students to conclude with those axioms at the end of courses? I work throughout the course to make my students become more aware of these concepts. I don't expect any of them to have a full grasp of what they mean because half the time I'm not sure I have a full grasp of what they mean. And I'm comfortable with that. I think in the classroom it's important to be flexible, both myself and with the students. I don't go and say, I'm the expert in this area. I'm more of the person that says, let's explore this together and see where we end up. And we may end up in a place and you go that way and I go this way, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, it's more of, let's take these ideas and, and see what develops. Some people get very interested in one area, and they still are going to learn the other areas, but something's going to grab them, and they're going to be moved by that. And then they're going to become mini experts in that area, and that's completely fine with me, especially when we have the videos where they're going to then take the information they've gotten, 
and share it with others in a way that it's a resource. It's another resource. They're not experts either. You know, they're not going to get the same hits as the, the Harvard lectures. But within our community, we will have more dialogues and conversation, which will again push it forward. Or sideways. It doesn't matter to me where it goes in the end. Yes. I can understand the importance of asking the students. You started off by saying you asked the students how they identify themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm a, a bit more concerned about encouraging them to create fake personalities, particularly when you tell them that this will have no consequences. You know, this is something we talk about. I don't know anything about Second Life, but many of my students are on it, and then there are bunches of gaming communities that they're invested in. And I watched a very interesting uh, TED Talks video about there's there's one online gaming community that if you don't pay every month you lose your identity which doesn't seem like a big deal it doesn't like seem that. like a big deal right but there's 600 people every morning in japan where this headquarter is to go pay it's it's like a hundred dollars they have to go in person and pay to get their identity back 600 people every day it sounds crazy to me uh, I'm not very comfortable with it, but I'm very intrigued with it. And, and part, of this, part of this, something we have to be aware of, is our identity. students are usually much more technologically advanced than we are. What we can do, we can't, we can't control any of the sources we have. We can only give our students a lens through which to see it and an opportunity to think critically about it. I still think an online identity, if I wanted to be you know, a man, I'd rather be a man online than to try and dress like a man and have to deal with my friends saying, what are you doing? Uh, you, you know, but there are other more subtle types of identities we might want to explore. And, and this is a place that is, quote unquote, safer. It's not completely safe. And we talk about this much more in depth in my class. Even Facebook, I used to be on Facebook. I don't want to be on Facebook. I don't, I, I don't want to hear what my friends ate for breakfast. But then there's, there are risks that you're taking that we do explore in the classroom. Yes. So, in, uh, your idea sounds very enlightening to me. Yeah? But I'm just, uh, could you please explain more, a little bit more about just how you assess or evaluate, I mean, the outcome of using this kind of environment. And, and you know, that is there any just a kind of relationship between, like, your, um, the, the student's identity, they know the identity more, and the language proficiency can be better something? <laughs> okay. The, the language proficiency part, if my students are engaging on a blog and they're engaging in class, uh, it's easy for me to look at the blog and say, oh, they're just commenting to Bob and Sally's ideas. They've not created any new ideas. And then I'll say, uh, Joan, why don't you tell me a little more fully about your ideas on this? and I can push them forward. The, the assessing it part for me, there's some challenges for me. What I want to do is move you farther than you were when you got there. People move at different levels, and uh, some of the best information I got, I got in the classroom, and it made no sense to me whatsoever. And I remember having an epiphany five years later about one concept, one idea. And I called my teacher and said, I got it. And he said, thanks for letting me know. You know, it's, it's hard to assess knowledge. It's hard to assess experience. Because sometimes we're waiting to have that opportunity to use the information that we've stored. We don't know when it's going to come up. So that part is harder. So I, I view it as, how can I engage the student to move from where they are to somewhere else? And how far can we get them to go? Sometimes they go really far. Sometimes nothing appears to happen, but I have to hope that a seed is planted that will influence them farther down the road. But that part, yeah, not so much. It's, it's more challenging. But if I, can, if I can comment on that, I think there are differences. I mean, assessment is an administrative concept. Yeah, yeah. It's not an intellectual concept. Mm -hmm. It's something that administrators like, governments like, people want to give you certificates and, de and, and, and degrees for. It's different from intellectual change, it's different from progress. Um, but my administrative
colleague here. Maybe. <laughs> 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 I'm picking on him. I'm Coming from an administrator himself. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I'm an administrator who actually, oh, I'm an ex-administrator mm. who actually wished he didn't have to be an administrator. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just kidding. But I, mean, I think that these distinctions need to be made. Assessment has always been something we worry about. So we create IELTS, uh, TOEIC, TOEFL, uh, ASLPR, we create our own tests, we, 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 and so on. And we forget that all of these are categorizations that we have invented. They don't exist naturally in, in some sense. We've just decided this is important, this is not important. And, and, and so your question is, so what do you think is important and how does the university put a stamp on it? Mm, yeah. Okay. And the answer is, well, you can find ways of doing that, but that is not necessarily where real progress happens. Thank you. You said it much more eloquently than I. <laughs> that, that's what it is. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>